our broadcast tonight, another provocation from North Korea. The communist state fires two short-range missiles into the sea off its east coast, the second such launch in a week. The situation is getting more dramatic by the hour in Ukraine, with the Russian military strengthening their grip on the Crimean Peninsula. A look at whether the country is on the brink of war and what the future holds for the troubled country. And plus, a new coalition party is on the works. Korea's main opposition party and independent lawmaker An Chur Su begin to lay the groundwork amid growing criticism from the ruling party. But these stories and more next on Arirang News at 8. Good evening to our viewers in Korea and hello to those of you who are tuning in from around the world. You're watching Arirang News at 8, live from Seoul. I am Yoo Ji-hae. We begin this evening with the latest provocation from North Korea. The communist state fired two short-range missiles off its eastern coast on Monday morning, the second such launch in under a week. The South Korea's defense ministry condemned the move, saying it is keeping a close watch for additional provocations. Hwang Sung-hee reports. South Korea's defense ministry remains on high alert after North Korea fired what are believed to have been two Scudsy short-range missiles into the East Sea early Monday morning. The ministry said the missiles flew about 500 kilometers, which means they could hit targets in South Korea and Japan. The launch comes just days after the North fired four short-range missiles from the same location. Such launches of short-range missiles by Pyongyang are a common part of its regular military drills. But Seoul sees the latest string of launches as an intentional provocation in protest against annual joint military exercises between South Korea and the United States. North Korea's short-range ballistic missile launch appears to be a typical two-sided tactic. The North seems to be intentionally ratcheting up tensions by firing the missiles during the key resolve exercises. South Korea views North Korea's recent missile launches as a violation of UN Security Council resolutions, as a handful of UN sanctions ban the regime from using ballistic missile technology. Experts say launches of this sort are considered a low-degree provocation compared to last year's saber-rattling from Pyongyang, which included threats of nuclear war against Seoul and Washington. Since they come amid thawing inter-Korean ties, experts say it could be a North Korean attempt to build its ground before entering another round of negotiations with the South. Hwang sang Arirang News. The first round of working level talks between Red Cross representatives from North Korea and Japan wrapped up on Monday with an agreement. Our Kim Min tells us what it entails and what it means. After six hours of Red Cross talks in the northeastern Chinese city of Shenyang on Monday, North Korea agreed to cooperate in repatriating the remains of Japanese nationals, although more specifics were not released. The three-day talks, the first since Prime Minister Shinzo Abe took office in late 2012, were proposed by the North. They were led by Lee ho Rim, Secretary General of the North's Red Cross Society, and Osamu Tasaka, Director General of the International Department at the Japanese Red Cross. Lee said soon after the meeting that officials from both countries need to meet regularly to discuss the repatriation issue. Top senior diplomats from both foreign ministries attended the meeting. But there's speculation that Japan wants to talk about Pyongyang repatriating Japanese abductees who are still alive in the North. The Japanese government lists 17 nationals it believes were abducted by North Korea in the 1970s and 80s. Tokyo, however, suspects Pyongyang may have kidnapped more. Five abductees were repatriated to Japan in 2002. Japan has been requesting that North Korea reinvestigate where the abductees are. North Korea continues to urge Tokyo to compensate for the suffering of the Korean people during Japan's brutal colonization of the Korean Peninsula in the early to mid-20th century. The Japanese government will address current outstanding bilateral issues, including the abduction of Japanese nationals, and will attempt to bring a proactive attitude out of North Korea. And what could be a first step toward resuming full-blown official discussions between North Korea and Japan? Eyes are focused on whether the Red Cross meetings will lead to formal bilateral talks between the two governments. Back in 2012, the first government-level meeting between the two countries was held in four years after similar Red Cross discussions. 
but follow-up talks were scrapped after North Korea launched a long-range rocket. Kim Hyun-bin, IDN News. A Christian missionary from Australia who had been detained in North Korea for around two weeks is a free man today. The North's official Korean Central News Agency says the regime released 75-year-old John Short in consideration of his age and because they say he apologized for violating North Korean laws. Short left for a trip to North Korea last month and was arrested after officials found Christian pamphlets in the Korean language in his luggage. The Australian arrived at Beijing Airport Monday morning and was picked up by the Australian embassy without making any public comments. Back here in the South, President Park Geun-hye says her vision of a unified Korea will go beyond overcoming division and will aim to create a new future for the peninsula, Northeast Asia and the world. The Korean leader was speaking at the Asian Leadership Conference in Seoul Monday, where she also added that there would be no fear of war or nuclear threats in a unified Korea, but freedom and peace for Koreans to enjoy. President Park then reaffirmed her recently announced commitment to set up a presidential preparatory committee committee for reunification. She also met with former U.S. President George W. Bush, who was in Seoul for Monday's conference, and thanked him for continuing his diplomatic activities to strengthen the Korea-U.S. alliance. A dramatic change in the political landscape seems inevitable as the leaders of Korea's two opposition parties announced plans over the weekend to launch a new coalition party that will be up and running ahead of local elections in June. Our Park Ji-won has this report. Following the surprise merger plan announced by the two leaders of main opposition blocs, Democratic Party leader Kim Han-gil and An chol su of the New Political Vision Party will start touring the nation from Wednesday to prepare the groundwork for the new party. Both agreed to complete necessary procedures of forming the new party before the June local elections by jointly setting up a preparatory committee comprised of five members from each party. Both parties aim to push ahead for the creation of the new United Party as soon as possible and to achieve a transfer of power in the presidential election in 2017. They said the new party will not nominate candidates for local council and world elections in the upcoming June elections, such as municipal council elections and local district council elections. The major party's nomination for local council member elections has long been considered a source of corruption and bribes. We decided not to nominate candidates for local wards and local council member elections in the June elections. This decision has been made after pondering what choices would be necessary to achieve the transfer of government in 2017. The new party will focus on the livelihoods of the people and on establishing a fairer economic system, along with a focus on launching further investigations into the spy agency's meddling in the 2012 presidential election. However, political insiders say they expect some friction during the merger process. The announcement of the coalition came as a big surprise, especially considering An chol su declared just a matter of weeks ago that he would launch his own new political party. An says he felt reassured about the merger plan when the DP decided to give up the controversial nomination system. The DP convened a general meeting of its assembly members on Monday to discuss future direction of the coalition. The ruling Senuri party denounced the merger, calling it collusion that is purely aimed at short-term political gain at the June elections. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. For the latest in news that impacts Korea and the world, join Yu Ji-hae for a lively half hour that covers politics, business, international news, and much more. Live at 8 every weeknight on Arirang TV. Tens of thousands of medical doctors here in Korea have announced that they will stage a one-day strike next Monday and then a six-day long one starting March 24th. The government, however, says it won't just sit idly by and let a medical crisis unfold. A UDN has this report. 
With an overwhelming yes vote of almost 80 percent, the Korea Medical Association has decided to go ahead with a nationwide walkout from March 10th. The protest is the first in 14 years, and given that over half of all practicing doctors nationwide participated in the vote, it could potentially deal a huge blow to the medical industry and to patients in need of medical services. Doctors in Korea are furious about a government plan announced late last year to introduce telemedicine and for-profit hospital subsidiaries. They're concerned such measures lay the groundwork for privatizing medical services. Doctors are feeling extremely desperate given the reality they are facing. So many will voluntarily take part in this strike. The Ministry of Health and Welfare is trying to reassure the public that the strike will not lead to that much inconvenience, given that they expect the participation rate to only be in the 20 to 30 percent range. The government has also vowed to take legal measures against those who take part in the strike. We first order the hospitals to resume operations. If it does not do so, it will be suspended from the all business operations for 15 days. Both the ruling and opposition parties have slammed the decision calling on the medical association to call off the walkout for the sake of patients' health. But since both the government and the medical association are refusing to back down, not many are holding much hope for a compromise anytime soon. Yurian, Arirang News. Now, President Park Geun-hye has tapped a veteran central bank official to be the new governor of the Bank of Korea. The presidential office spokesperson said that nominee Lee Ju-yeol had a profound knowledge of central bank business and has a good sense of judgment about the international financial market. He started work at the central bank in 1977 and has held key positions throughout the years, including as the head of the research department. He was also deputy to current governor Kim Jung-soo for about two years until 2012. He is considered to be neutral when it comes to monetary policies. The National Assembly will hold a confirmation hearing for E within the next 20 days. And moving now to the trade front, Korea leapfrogged Japan to become the biggest player in the Chinese import market last year, taking the number one spot for the first time. Arirang News' Na Young Kyung takes a look at what might be pushing up Korea's share in China. Korea became the number one contributor to China's import market for the first time in 2013. This according to the Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade, as well as the Korea International Trade Association. The agencies say Korea beating Japan for the position was possible due to China's growing demand for Korean electronics and manufacturing goods. Data shows Korea's share in China's import market jumped 0.07 percentage point to 9.2% in 2013 compared to 2012, while that of Japan shed more than one percentage point to 8.2%. The products China sought after the most from Korea were electronic integrated circuits. China imported more than $45 billion of ICs from Korea last year, a near 15 percent increase from the previous year. Analysts in Seoul, however, warn because China is attempting to boost its domestic demand, Korea should also come up with ways to accommodate Beijing's changing growth paradigm. Meanwhile, Korea's trade balance remained in the black for the 25th consecutive month in February, according to Trade Ministry data. However, February's trade surplus of $926 million was significantly lower than the same month last year, when it stood at nearly $1.9 billion. Officials attribute the fall to economic crises in emerging economies, coupled with slower-than-expected recoveries in developed economic powerhouses. Na Hyun Kyung, Arirang News. Some tech news. Samsung Electronics recently launched the world's first curved ultra-high definition TVs here in Korea. The Korean tech giant is betting big on this cutting-edge technology with the aim of reshaping the global TV industry, as our Kwon Soa reports. Curved ultra-definition televisions, or curved UHD TVs, are this year's hot new trend in the consumer display industry. UHD TVs can support resolutions that are up to four times higher than traditional HD TVs. However, these premium features will come at a cost, with most models carrying a 20 percent premium. But Samsung Electronics says it's worth the added price, 
as the slight curve will give viewers unparalleled picture quality. We took LCD panels and realized we could bend them. With curved screens, we can implement an overwhelming immersive experience. TV manufacturers are hoping that UHD will become the new standard for the industry. And in order to ensure the trend doesn't lose momentum, Samsung says it has signed a number of deals with Hollywood firms such as Fox and Paramount to pump out UHD content. Meanwhile, hometown rival LG Electronics is teaming up with local cable providers to supply dedicated UHD programming. We're increasingly moving towards UHD TV, since it appears to be in the clear direction the market is moving in. In terms of content, it's much easier to make UHD content than it is for 3D TVs. Though these Korean tech giants currently have the lead in market share and technology, Chinese competitors are quickly closing the gap. But both companies are confident that unlike past consumer fads like 3D, this new era of UHD will make sure they stay ahead of the curve. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. A red alert in Ukraine as tensions remain sky high and new developments are unfolding by the hour. The current crisis has led the group of seven nations to condemn Russia for invading Ukraine and to cancel preparations for an upcoming G8 summit. Our Shin se -min has the details. The international community is stepping up pressure on Russia to pull its troops out of Ukraine, but Crimea is under the control of Russian soldiers. The group of seven major industrialized nations on Sunday condemned Moscow's invasion of Ukraine and even canceled preparations for an upcoming G8 summit scheduled to take place in Sochi in June. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who will arrive in Kiev on Tuesday, has condemned Russia for what he called an incredible act of aggression. The U.S. Congress has already called for sanctions against Russia. Russia's parliament has already given the green light to its president, Vladimir Putin, to use military force to protect its citizens in Ukraine, defying calls from the international community not to intervene. Over the weekend, Ukraine mobilized its forces for a possible confrontation with Russia after Russia dispatched over 6,000 troops to Crimea and surrounded several small Ukrainian military stations, demanding them to disarm. On Sunday, Ukraine's Navy chief defected to Russia after having been appointed just a day before. Russia has also been staging military exercises involving 150,000 troops along its border with Ukraine. Shin se -min, Arirang News. So the big questions now are whether Ukraine really is on the brink of war and what does the future hold for the country? From Ukraine's deepening internal divide to what the West and Russia want, Arirang News' Hong Jisan digs a little deeper into the ongoing unrest. Ukraine has warned it is on the brink of disaster and any invasion by Russia would mean war. Both Russia and the West say they want a peaceful resolution. What would Putin securing permission to use Russian troops, not just in Crimea but in Ukraine as a whole? The crisis could well develop into a full-blown clash of violence. Russia and the West are at loggerheads on the fundamental question of who is the legitimate authority in Ukraine. Western powers say it is the new interim government in Kiev authorized by the Ukrainian parliament. Russia says Kiev is in the hands of an illegitimate government of far-right extremists installed as a result of a coup that ousted President Viktor Yanukovych. Moscow wants the West and Kiev to go back to their agreement signed with Yanukovych to all discussions about constitutional reform, but that would effectively mean recognizing the new Ukrainian government as illegitimate. Although the conflict has intensified, the deployment of Russian troops to Crimea has not yet led to bloodshed. Western powers, backed by NATO and the White House, are calling on the Kremlin to send its military forces back to Russian bases and to refrain from any further interference in Ukraine, threatening it of economic penalties. Ukraine, sandwiched between Europe and Russia's southwestern border, has been plunged into chaos since the Austrian President Yanukovych on February 22nd, following bloody street protests that left dozens dead and hundreds wounded. Ukraine faces a deepening internal divide. Those in the West, 
the majority of whom speak Ukrainian and are more liberal, generally support the interim government and its European Union tilt. But the better off, Russian-speaking eastern half prefer a Ukraine over which Russia casts a long shadow. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. In other global news, from a massive volcano eruption in Guatemala to Hollywood's biggest night, we now connect live to Paul Lee at the News Center. Now, Paul, let's start in neighboring China, where thousands of the country's policymakers are gathering in Beijing this week. That's right, Jiang. China's top political body opened its nine-day session in the Great Hall of the People on Monday. Top party and state leaders were in attendance, including President Xi Jinping and Premier Li Keqiang. The 2,200 deputies attending the annual session of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference will discuss major issues concerning the country's development. Some of the other main topics on the agenda include China's economic growth forecasts, foreign relations, reform policies, and tackling chronic pollution. The event, however, has been overshadowed by a deadly knife attack at a train station in the southwestern Chinese city of Kunming. A severe violent terrorist attack happened on March 1st at the Kunming railway station in Yunnan province. We extend our profound condolences to the civilians killed in the incident. Please stand in silent tribute. Meanwhile, Chinese authorities are continuing their investigation into the Kunming knife attack that killed at least 29 people and injured over 130 others this past weekend. Two days after the attack, security remains tight around the train station in southwestern China. Xinhua News Agency says police shot four of the attackers dead and captured one, but about five others are still on the run. Beijing has blamed the attack on weaker Muslim separatists from the Xinjiang in China's far west. China's domestic security chief has vowed all-out efforts to bring those responsible to justice. Moving over to Central America, a large volcano has erupted in Guatemala, where authorities are on the verge of issuing emergency evacuations for some 3,000 people living in the area. The Bacaya volcano began spewing ash and lava on Saturday and followed up on Sunday with new explosions. The ash has reportedly reached a height of at least three kilometers. Flights have been diverted from the area, and Guatemalan authorities are continuing to monitor the situation. And the 86th Academy Awards has wrapped up in Hollywood with a historical drama 12 Years a Slave winning Best Picture. Meanwhile, the space drama Gravity stole the night with seven Oscars. Mesker director Alfonso Cuaron got a nod for Best Director for Gravity. He is the first Latin American to win the Best Director award for adding the six Oscars for technical achievement. Matthew Conway won Best Actor for his performance in Dallas Buyers Club. That's all for me for now, but I'll be back with more updates in just about two hours. Another blast of snow hit the United States while we here in Korea are getting ready for spring rain. For more, let's go over to our Kim Bogyang at the Weather Center. Now, Bogyang, another winter storm in the U.S.? That's right, Tihe. Another blast of storm hit the United States. So, um, parts of partially the federal government has been shut down and thousands of flights were canceled. Plus, on Sunday local time, about 23 centimeters of snow piled up in the state of Indiana. Back here in the nation, we're currently seeing clear skies. However, spring raising is forecast in the southern regions tomorrow, which will begin in Teju. And through tomorrow, Teju will get 5 to 30 millimeters of precipitation and other parts of the southern regions about 5 to 10 millimeters. Other than that, tomorrow's daytime highs will peak from between 10 to 13 degrees, so please continue to be aware of the big temperature gap between the day and night. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul starts off the day at 0 degrees with a high of 11. Meanwhile, Gwangju and Busan reach 12. Moving on to other regions, Daejeon and Jeju make it to the low teens, while Dokdo tops out at 7. Well, that's all the weather update for Korea, and here's a look at the international weather. 
And that brings us to the end of our newscast. I'm Yuji Hae in Seoul. I'll be back with more news updates on our primetime news at 10 p.m. Korea time. See you then.